Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. So wonderful to see you all today on this beautiful Sunday morning. Let's stand and worship together. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's time. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. those of you who uh, kept us in your prayers as we traveled to Ravutsa, Slovakia. Uh, your prayers were answered if you prayed for safe travels and a good time there in the country. And uh, other than a few hiccups, I think the trip was better than we could have expected. Uh, the purpose of our trip was to uh, see what a partnership between the church there in Ravutsa and our church here at F First Baptist would look like. If you remember back in February, uh, they sent a team over here and they... Uh, stayed in our homes and they visited with us in small groups. They uh, spoke on Sunday mornings. They, one of their leaders, Richard, brought a message on Wednesday night and they were a blessing uh, to us. They were a blessing to me and to our church. And they asked that we do the same, that we travel there, that uh, we meet their people, see how they do church and uh, immerse ourselves in the culture of Slovakia for a short time and just experience the joy of serving the same God in Slovakia that we serve here in America. And uh, also to see some of the struggles and challenges that they face and to see what, uh, to see if we have resources or gifts or talents here at First Baptist that uh, might help them in some of the struggles and challenges that they have. And also to see uh, what resources do they have, what gifts, what special talents do they have that uh, might further God's work here in Weatherford and I think that's what, uh, that's what God does in Galatians 6, 2. It says if we share each other's burdens, we fulfill uh, Christ's law. So Barbara's going to tell you a little bit about what we did while we were in Slovakia. Well, the team had great um, activities planned for us so that we could experience the culture and the beauty of Slovakia. Uh, we got a real sense of community as we shared meals in team members' homes, saying fellowship with them. We were able to go to the location where they hold their summer camp. Uh, this camp is a very important part of their ministry to reach the students there. Uh, we were able to pray for the leadership and the students that will be attending this summer. We also were able to go to uh, a high school and interact with students there. Uh, some of our team members spoke, we played games, we got in groups and were able to share God's love because uh, as Seth 
Seth had shared uh, why we were there in Rivutsa. Uh, we went to a mountaintop where they like to go and uh, just pray for their church work. It was really special. We attended a church service, had good message, fellowship with other uh, people in their church. And one thing that we did that was uh, really important for this trip was we walked around Rebutsa to three locations that are possible building opportunities for them. And we were able to pray at each location for God's direction uh, for the church plant there. Okay, so Seth challenged me to speak about what this trip meant. Uh, I've got about eight pages of notes, so sorry, Earl. Uh, okay, first of all, I'd like to give thanks to our church uh, for being mission-minded, uh, for loving on us, uh, praying for us um, while we were gone, before we went. Um, I'd like to say a thanks to Trey and Elise, who were... Uh, very helpful while we were over there who have the experience through years of mission work there um, for our team uh, we I felt we really supported each other and lifted each other up for my family for allowing me to go and, and giving me the confidence to do that and for Seth who um, I don't I know you all know Seth but uh, he really is wise beyond his years um, a man of faith and a vision and just want to say thank you to Seth all right, so my whole life, um, I have said no to missions, uh, as long as I can remember, uh, mission trips. I, I've sent my kids on mission trips. I've given to missions. I've even served on the missions committee, which is ironic, um, but I've never gone. I've had these lies that were told me by the enemy that uh, I'm not a world changer. I'm too busy. My family needs me here. I have no special talent or skill that God can use there. But when the Slovakian or Ravutsa team came to visit our life group um, at the Bolin Alley, uh, I got to speak with Richard, uh, their pastor. And he posed a question to me that most men ask each other, what do you do? And I had to explain to him that I worked all the time. And he asked me, why? And that was a hard question, because why do I work all the time? And did I enjoy working that much? Well, my answer was no. Uh, from that conversation, God convicted me. Uh, I've served a church in various areas, Sundays, Wednesdays, uh, Monday morning D groups. Um, but everything else was work. All the in-between was work. And what his question showed me that God was in the in-between. And that's where I needed to refocus myself to see that God is in everything that I do. So when Seth asked who wanted to go, I said, not in these exact words, but here I am, send me. Slovakia is a beautiful country with magnificent scenery, uh, beautiful vistas, castle ruins, um, very picturesque. Think of the sound of music the entire country. I mean, it was beautiful. But what really amazed me were its people. Um, they have a heart for God. Um, they're missioned, minded in everything that they do. They live in this little town just for their church plant. Many have moved from all over their country just to be there. Um, they have a mission mindset, not just during their worship time, but in their daily lives, and that was inspiring to me. Their joy and love for one another and for the lost in their community uh, was inspiring, um, and yet they allowed, or I got to inspire them or encourage them. I, that To me, that was really moving, that this burned out American can come there and encourage them. They need our encouragement, they need our support, whether it's through our talents, our treasures, um, our time. What it meant for me was a change in perspective for global missions, which is Jesus' cause. You know, I had accepted salvation. I had joined the church, but I'd never gone to make disciples. So my perspective change was what it meant to me. 
My hope is that through my story, theirs, and uh, all those involved, our team, everyone will see Christ in them as I did. Uh, one of Richard's favorite sayings, which is on our shirts, it is better to play a small role in a big story than to be the hero in a story that doesn't matter. So I challenge all of you to pray about this, to lift up the team in Ravutsa and all those involved. And I'd like to give a shout out to my roomies, Gabriel and Peter, great young men, and the Ravutsa Church. Thank you. Amen. Jerry, those eight pages just flew by. Now, let's stand and continue together.
Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we know that you are worthy, that, uh, uh, that through the blood of the Lamb that, that we can be righteous, we can be, uh, we can be with God, which is better by far. And, and Lord, I just want to thank you for uh, uh, the, uh, these mission trips that, uh, that our people have been on. And, and Lord, you have been felt there. You have been, uh, been felt in these places. Uh, and Lord, we know that you're working in lives. And, and, uh, and Lord, it is uh, such a fulfillment to see that, that last pillar uh, being fulfilled. And, and Lord, let us continue to, to go and make disciples. We love you and we praise you. In your name I pray. and teaches me about computers and he's always caring and he's funny and he makes good friends. He helps me with softball. That he always takes us to adventures. He cares about us while our mom has gotten Edmund for work. Um, he, I'm, I love my dad. He takes us all, all of the places. He makes us dinner. He lets us stay up late, and that's what I like about my dad. He's really nice. Thank you, sweet and funny. Well, I love my dad, how he's so funny, and that he's really nice. He's nice. He's kind and smart. Um, he's really nice and funny and kind, and he he's always there for me. He takes me fishing and uh, make um, kicking snacks with me and um, hugging you and I see you and when I get to hang out with him. He touches and he plays with me. Um, he's very funny and very crazy. He helps me when I'm here. What I love most about my dad is because he is a great worker, he works hard, he is just a great dad. He helps me in sports, school, basically anything if I need help. I love sports. That, that's because he um, is funny. He cooks me things like biscuit and steak, and he teaches me how to play softball, and he gives me birthday presents and Christmas presents. Daddy coaches softball. He's very loving and hardworking. I like when he teaches me about new stuff and like how he teaches me how to do the computer and like he's always funny and he like just likes to like mess with tools. He just helps us out with our house a lot, and it's just fun to spend time with him. Okay. Well, happy Father's Day. Uh, we appreciate those children who uh, shared about their dads. Uh, I also had a good dad. I was blessed to have a good father. I spent a lot of time with him. He influenced my life a lot. I didn't realize it was happening when I was growing up. I started going to work with him after my sixth grade and spent lots of time with him. He taught me how to work, taught me how to fish and how to hunt and a lot of things, and he impacted my life. And I'm blessed because I had a good dad. And not everybody has that same experience. Uh, some of you may have had a dad who was either, uh, maybe he was absent or he was uh, grippy. He could have been mean. Uh, there's all kinds of dads out there. Uh, but I was blessed to have a good one. Uh, one man that had a bad dad is the subject of our sermon this morning. Morning. His name is Josiah. Josiah was one of the few really good kings in Judah. He may have been the best king ever as far as Judah had as far as what the scriptures say about him, and yet his dad was a wicked, evil uh, individual, and yet he rose above what happened as far as the father he had and the grandfather that he had, and he uh, really lived a life of, of, for God as far as the impact that he had in the world that was around him. 
And so this morning, we're going to use him as an example of what I title overcoming a bad father. But in reality, everything that I say about fathers could be applied to every one of us who is here today. Because uh, while fathers have a special role, uh, it's not really that much more special than every follower of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to emphasize fathers just because it is Father's Day. I wore uh, some socks that my kids gave me one year. I do that every year whether I need to or not. And uh, so I'm celebrating Father's Day. Uh, but what I say, if you are not a father, don't tune me out because everything that I say is going to be of significance on how we uh, live ourselves. Uh, second, first and Second Kings is like a broken record. There's this repeating cycle of people doing bad things, and then they'll have kids that do bad things, and then they'll they're a wicked king. I mean, sum up uh, 40 years of leadership, and just he was he did what was evil on the side of the Lord, and then he died. And so you just clip through all this, and it's every once in a while you get a good king, and that's what we're going to look at this morning, and the man uh, by the name of Josiah. I'm going to read different parts of chapters 21, 22, and 23. Uh, in your leisure, you can read the entire story. You're going to have to trust me for some of the in-between part that I mention. But I just give, I'm giving us enough to get a feel for the life that Josiah lived, his background, and uh, so I'm going to read through here, beginning, first of all, in chapter 21, at verse 19 through verse 24. Amon was 22 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Meshulameth, the daughter of Haruz of Jotbah. And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, as Manasseh his father had done. He walked in all the way in which his father walked, and served the idols that his father served, and worshipped them. He abandoned the Lord, the God of his fathers, and did not walk in the way of the Lord. And the servants of Ammon conspired against him and put the king to death in his house. But the people of the land struck down all those who had conspired against King Ammon. And the people of the land made Josiah his son king in his place. Verse 1 of chapter 22. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidiah, Jedidah the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he walked in all the way of, the fa of David his father, and he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Chapter 23, verse 25. Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to all the law of Moses, not, nor not did any like him arise after him. I drop down to verse 29. It says, In the, his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went out up to the king of Assyria, to the river Euphrates. King Josiah went to meet him, and Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo as soon as he saw him. And his servants carried him dead in the chariot from Megiddo and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in his father's place. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his fathers had done. Josiah uh, was a father who served the Lord as king of Judah. Uh, whatever your role in life is, God expects you to faithfully serve him in that role that you find in life. And so as we look at this text this morning, looking primarily at Josiah, the boy king who grew to be a man who served the Lord so faithfully and set a great example, uh, three things that I'm going to point out to you about fathers and also about all of us. Fathers influence their families, uh, fathers impact their worlds, and fathers exit this life. First of all, fathers influence their families. Uh, the role of father as the head of the home is not a role to be a dictator or to tell, boss everybody around, but it means that you are the chief influencer, that you have huge responsibilities to fulfill, and fathers influence uh, their homes or their families, beginning with their spouse, with their spouse. We have these names of the mothers of, 
uh, Josiah and his dad and his son and all the different names, which I cannot repeat, which thank you for not naming your children those names. I have enough trouble as it is remembering how to spell everybody's name, so I'm glad that we don't have those names. Uh, but we have them, and we don't have any full-blown description of a uh, relationship that Josiah had with his, the mother of his children. We don't have that. But we do know from the New Testament that the responsibility of the father is to love his wife uh, the, the husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that the f husband has a responsibility to meet the needs of his wife, to help her, to lead her. Um, I remember when I was a young, uh, just freshly married, the pastor we had said, the, and I didn't have any kids at the time, but he said, the best thing you can do to raise your kids is to be crazy in love with their mama. And I thought, you know, that's, that's a good thing to remember, that the way that you are a good father, it begins with your spouse as far as the love that you have for your spouse and uh, the way you care for them. My wife had an oncology uh, an appointment with her oncologist. We go back every four months, got a great report. But the, the, the doctor is a friend of ours uh, from high school days in Hobart. And uh, she made the comment, uh, she, she, said, she told me, she said, you are really lucky to be married to her, and which I agreed. I, I appreciate everybody reminding me that I am only what I am because of Nancy, and I appreciate that. Thought I'd go to Oklahoma City and get away from it, but I didn't. And uh, and then she went on. She went on to say that who you have as a spouse in life has such a huge impact on the life that you experience in this world. And he said, and she said uh, that uh, she said I have people that are patients that they're married, but they they aren't friends and they don't share life and they don't. I mean, it, it's just not much fun for them. That. The beginning of that joy in life is in the, that relationship you have with your spouse. And so fathers influence their families beginning with their spouse, uh, continuing with their children. The main influence that you have is by the attitude you maintain and the actions that you take. Uh, you don't change your children so much by the lectures that you give to them as it is by the life that you live in front of them. Um, values are caught uh, more than they're taught. I remember how shocked I was. Uh, when I was in seminary 40-something years ago, and they said that by the time a child is three years old, they have 85% of their values, which sounded crazy uh, to me. Uh, but uh, I'm sure research verifies that. I, w I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know that beginning at a very young age, uh, fathers influence their children. They have an influence just by being with them. Uh, I remember when I got my first pair of Levi's 501 jeans. I was either 6th or 7th grade. And it was, I could not button those things hardly for anything. They were just so hard that, you know, it just took an act of Congress to get those things buttoned. But I was determined to wear those because they were the kind of jeans that my daddy wore. And I wanted to wear those grown-up kind of jeans. I also remember this, too. My dad, at that, he eventually quit. But at that time, he was chewing day's work tobacco comes in a plug and really dark and I remember sl slipping some of that out and going and sitting on the picnic table and uh, wanting to be like daddy and getting sick as a horse or a dog or whatever it, what it is you get sick as uh, but my goal was not I didn't want to become addicted to tobacco and I didn't at that time uh, but uh, it was just I wanted to be like daddy and daddy you need to remember that the influence you have on your children positive or negative is a very real thing uh, because of the time you spend with them and fathers influence their families beginning with their spouses continuing with their children to a certain extent children grow up and they become adults and they make their own decisions and the influence that you have on them as you raise them up in the way that they should go never goes away but you cannot force children to live a certain way. That's one of the attractions that I had to this text, was that Josiah had a father who was evil and didn't do what God wanted him to do, but then Josiah did do what God wanted him to do, and there's never one like him before. There never wasn't like him again. He did great. And then as a result, after that, he has a son who is evil. And does what's evil in the sight of the Lord. And then he only lasted two months. I didn't read more verses. You can read the rest of that. Then he's replaced by another son. And that son did evil in the sight of the Lord as well. And so you have Josiah, who's the father. And he has an influence on his children to a certain extent. He's able to do that. 
but he's not able to make, he can't force his two sons to be exactly like he is. And I would just give a word of encouragement to you if you're a father or a mother, and your children have done some things that are not what you wanted them to do or thought they would do, that you'd realize that you are accountable for the life that you live. And yes, you are to be a good example to them and to have an influence on them, but there is a limit to the amount of influence that you have on their lives and how much you affect them. I've been preaching the gospel since I was 14 years old. I was almost 15, but I was 14. Um, my brother was addicted to alcohol by about the when he turned 16. And it just rolled into other things for about 25 years, and then he died of an overdose. We slept in the same bed. We had the same parents. We went hunting with the same father. We ate the same chocolate chip cookies that my mother made. I don't understand that. But I do know that it's a reality. So don't blame yourself for what's not your fault. You raise your children in the way that they should go. And usually, there's a high probability. Almost always, it goes well. But there are some times when it doesn't make any sense. And you don't need to beat yourself up about that. Fathers influence their families. Secondly, fathers impact their world. The responsibilities of a, of a father and of a mother, all of us, we all have responsibilities that are, none of those responsibilities are more important than our family, but there are other responsibilities that we fulfill in this world that are very significant, and it's part of being a father, being a mother, being, in, being a responsible person. You do it for your family. And so we impact uh, our world uh, as God ac assigns. Uh, Josiah showed up, and he's king of Judah. He's eight years old. Now, obviously, he doesn't run the... Well, maybe he did. I don't know. we got kids running the world now, it seems like, sometimes. So maybe he did. But he had mentors. He had people that helped him. But he, just, he came into the world a certain way, and he ends up king of Judah, and that was his assignment, and that's what he did in a very faithful way. He is significantly doing that. That's, that's his assignment by God. In the same way, uh, you have a purpose in life. You show up, and we are not a blank tablet to be written on by parents and the culture in any way possible. We show up uh, with, a, with, I call it a bent we have, we have a certain bent toward things that we are good at, that we enjoy doing, that are, that's, that's, that's how we fit in. That's, that's how God assigns us. And he gives us opportunities. Now, this does not mean that you're looking for a needle in a haystack to find your purpose in life. There's a whole half section out there to enjoy and to serve God in many ways that he has for you to serve him. The main thing that he's concerned about is who you become more so than what you do. And so don't misinterpret that to mean, well, I've got to find this, this elusive thing that God wants me to do. No, there's all kinds of things out there, but it's assigned by God. Josiah was assigned to be king. He didn't get a vote on that. That's what he does. And so he impacts the world as God assigns, as God empowers it says in verse 25 of chapter 23, where it says, uh, Before him was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all that the law of Moses, uh, or did any like him arise after him. He turns to the Lord with all his heart, his soul, his mind. Well, that, that's what Jesus said was the greatest commandment, was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. It would be the equivalent of what we always talk about, abiding in Christ, that we abide in God. And so God has to empower me to do what he asked me to do in life. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, and, but I can't do it by myself. And so there comes this point where I am crucified with Christ. I give up my rights to myself, and then he lives inside of me, and he empowers me to do it. Josiah was not the king that he was because he, was a, he, he really knew how to do things. It was because he turned his life over to God, and then God empowered him to do what God asked him to do. The same way with you. You can't do what God has asked you to do in your own power, but you can do it when you yield to him, and he works through you, and he empowers you to do it. He, can, he always empowers us to do everything he asks us to do. 
Fathers impact their worlds as God assigns, as God empowers, and as God leads. Uh, with doing what God wants you to do, you're never one and done. Josiah was this king of Judah. And the first thing that he did is listed that he led in restoring the temple in Jerusalem. They had a lot of money on hand. They never had used it to restore it, and so he gets that going. And they gave money to people that restored all of this temple. And while they're restoring the temple, then they discover part of the word of God in the Old Testament, probably Deuteronomy. And they read that to Josiah. And when he sees where his, the nation has gone away from God, he's aware of that as he hears the word of God. He rips his clothes and throws ashes on his head and he repents of his sin and the sin of the nation. And he brings about this turning back to God by the nation and he reestablishes the observance of the Passover. He does all these things. And of course, it's 31 years. He's the king. And so it's leading one thing at a time and he continues to follow after God. And that's how you impact your world. You follow as he leads it wasn't all at once. He didn't do all these things when he was eight years old. It was like one thing at a time. And you keep following after God's will in your life. And you go from stage to stage and from thing to thing. And you do all these different things. And as you do that, he continues to guide you. And you impact the world as God leads. And you continue to do what he asks you to do. Now, it's as simple and as complex as the children of Israel in the wilderness when God just said... I'm going to be in front of you in the pillar of a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, and you just follow whenever that cloud moves, you follow it. When you're reading about that and you're, an eight, you're eight years old, sounds pretty simple. Just follow the cloud. Easy. Just go where God wants you to go. And that's what they did for 40 years. Now, here would be the challenge, though. If you're on the tabernacle moving crew, which I would be as a priest or preacher or whatever, I figured out why they retired when they were 50. Because they had to carry that whole thing around. If you read about what all that's made of, all the goat skins and all the hide and how big it is and all the poles and all the... It's, I mean, it's a massive undertaking. And I'm sure they get all set up and they get ready and they're going to stay there for a while. And then they wake up the next morning and the clouds moved. Now, if I'm on the tabernacle moving team, I probably won't say it out loud because I'm be afraid I might get struck by lightning or something. But beneath my breath, I'm just like, are you kidding me? We just got set up. I, just about the time I get comfortable, then it moves. Isn't that what happens in our life? Just about the time you get comfortable, and everything seems like it's lining up, and everything's got, then it's like God puts thorns in the nest, and you get to move on and do something else, and he's just always pushing us along to give us abundant life, so we'll trust him more and more, and that's God uses fathers and mothers and children. He uses all of us to impact our worlds as he assigns, as he empowers, and as he leads. So, fathers influence their families. Fathers impact their worlds. And then finally, fathers exit this life. A friend of mine reminded me of what it, I'd forgotten about this, but I'd reminded me of after my dad died... My mom lived on the home place, southwest of Hobart, for a couple of years. I can't remember exactly how long it was, but she's out there by herself. And she started seeing a snake in the house. Wasn't a rattlesnake, but a big snake. And it's crawling around. She, she had one of her brothers come up and look for it, and they stuck some steel wool in a hole by the washer and dryer or something. I mean, it's like, no, nah, there's no big deal. Let's have a sandwich. Well, my mom kept seeing the snake. And then one, one day, she shut the drawer in the desk, the lower drawer in the desk in the kitchen, and it wouldn't go all the way in. And she knew what happened. She knew what it was. And later on, here's what she said. She told me. She, she said, I knew Daddy wasn't coming back, and I had to handle this. And so she put on a glove. I, I wouldn't have thought I'd have, I guess that makes it better. <laughs> Jerk the drawer out of the desk, grabs the snake, carries it outside, throws it on the ground, and then she said she realized she threw it down too quick. It's too close. It can get back in the house. Picks it up again, <laughs> takes it further down, 
And then she got a hoe and the Lord called it home. <laughs> when Daddy died, life changed. And so the same way here, all fathers exit this life. None of us live forever. It's appointed unto man once to die. After this, the judgment. And fathers exit this life when their time comes. Josiah uh, was a great king. Uh, he was leading the people to get closer to God. He's doing all these great things. And he's 39 years old. And then the Pharaoh Necho sees him on the battlefield. He, Josiah goes out and does what kings do, do. He shows up on the battlefield. He's not really going to go to the front lines and fight. But Pharaoh Necho sees him, goes over, and the Bible just says, and he killed him right then. And so his time was up. That should, now, that doesn't mean that we can't do things that allow us to live longer. I agree that when your time's up, your time's up, but also there, sometimes you can uh, kind of fast forward or update your time of departure a little bit by things you do and say, Jesus said not to, said don't put your Lord to the test by doing stupid stuff. So you want to live in such a way that you give yourself the best chance. But the reality is that when the time comes, we all leave this world. The sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man are not enemies, they're friends. And so they work together. And fathers exit this life when their time comes. Um, when I was in college, we used to have this saying, we'd say, uh, pray like studying doesn't help and study like praying doesn't help. And so it's not either or, it's both and. And so a father's exits this life when their time comes. When your time comes, you will no longer be in this world, just like Josiah. Leaving their mark. When you leave this world, you will be remembered, and you will have had an influence on the lives of other people. Josiah left this world when he was 39 years old, and he was such a great king and did such a good job uh, while he was here that people remembered him then and we're still remembering him today because of the life that he lived the impact that he had he overcame having a bad father he didn't make a bunch of excuses he wasn't a victim he was an overcomer by the grace of God he did what he did and we remember him uh, for what he did he left a mark just like you're leaving a mark you're leaving a mark that will influence people after you're gone. You're, this world is affected by how you live one way or another, either good or, good or bad. You're, you're leaving a mark, and uh, just like uh, Josiah left a mark. And you know, Josiah was not remembered because of his sons or because of his daddy. You won't be remembered because of your children or because of your family tree. The mark you leave is the mark you leave as a follower of Jesus Christ. And you need to, you need to love your parents and love your kids. And love, but the main thing you need to do is serve the Lord through your whole heart, soul, and mind. And that's how you leave a mark, is by the life that you live. Uh, my dad was a great fan of Charles Spurgeon. Uh, the last several years of his life, my dad read a sermon of Spurgeon's every, every day. I've got six huge books that he read the whole things. I mean, they're like mammoth. And so when my dad died, uh, we picked out one of Charles Spurgeon's sayings and put it in his, I've still got his funeral flyer. Um, but here's the one that, that uh, we picked out. A good character is the best tombstone. Those who loved you and were helped by you will remember you when forget-me-nots have gone. Carve your name on hearts, not on marble. And that should be the goal that we have in life, is that we want to leave a mark on the hearts and lives of people. I think, it'd be, I mean, not to get our name written down so that somebody reads it from now on, but that you make such a huge impact by the life that you live and the influence that you have, that long after you're gone, people are still following Christ because of the influence that you had, leaving their mark while life goes on. 
American poet Robert Frost lived between 1874 and 1963. He said, I can sum up everything that I've learned in life in three words. It goes on. And did you notice here, Josiah, this great king, been serving for 31 years. He's initiated all these reforms. He's led the people to follow God. He's done all these great things, and God has used him in a mighty way. And then he goes out to the battlefield, and Pharaoh Necho kills him on sight. They load him up in a chariot, take him back to Jerusalem, put him in a tomb, and put his son in position of, I mean, it's like, it's like you didn't even miss him. Doesn't even say anybody cried. It's like life goes on. And uh, it does, which is fine. That's how it happens. And that as life goes on, the mark that you've left continues to be a positive or a negative in the kingdom of God. And that's why it's so important that, first of all, that we be ready for the time of our departure from this life, because we don't know when it's going to happen. So we want to make sure that we have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. And then on top of that, we also should want to live in such a way that we make an impact in a positive way for the kingdom of God. Because it, it does make a difference how we live. After my dad died over 15 years ago, Rusty Hartzell sent me a letter. And if you didn't know Rusty, you missed out. That guy used to, he could preach a better sermon praying a prayer than I could ever have preaching. So he, he's a great guy. He sent this to me. And this was his letter to welcome me to the Dead Daddies Club. I want to read the last paragraph. Earl, I know you're hurting, and it truly, truly saddens me to, say, to see that happen. But this letter is to let you know that the missing him will not... Sorry. The missing him will not go away, but the pain of it mostly leaves, and the memories become a sweet spot. A private place that you will carry with you always... A place of rest, pleasant thoughts, pieces of humor, life's instructions, and many other good things. Oh, yes. And it's not all in the past, because in the future, you will do things and think, why did I do that? And you'll remember that it was the exact way your daddy did it. It's true that the apple does not fall far from the tree. Happy memories. Sweet thoughts. Stand for prayer. God, we thank you for happy memories and sweet thoughts of godly men, many of whom we had the privilege of calling Daddy. Thank you for the influence that they had on our lives, the impact that they had on the world that continues even after they're gone. In the aftermath of the story about Josiah, Pray that you'd remind us of the need to be ready for the time of our own physical death, that it comes at a time when we probably aren't expecting and we just need to be ready. So thank you for making that so easy because of the price that Jesus paid for us on the cross. And then also, uh, we're reminded today that our life leaves a mark and we have an impact. Help us to live with integrity and consistency uh, being a small part of that huge story uh, 
of your kingdom and that the race that we run, that we'd run it well and use us in the way that you choose. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. During our final song, if I can help you in any way, I'll be here at the front. If you'd rather visit with me later, I'll be around. Uh, let God speak to you as we sing.
Good morning, church. We are so glad that you gathered to worship with us today. Uh, I'm clearly not in Oklahoma. Um, it was my joy to be a part of a team of eight people who came out to, to have a vision trip to visit our friends in Revuca, Slovakia. Um, and, and over my right shoulder, you can see that the town and we're having a, a kind of a campfire meal for our last evening here. And so it's just been a wonderful time. Thank you for church for being involved in this mission trip financially, prayerfully, and, and for our other trips as too, with Salt Lake City and Amarillo just getting back as well. Um, church, it is so wonderful to be a part of a body that believes in going and serving the Lord uh, across the nations. And so look, going forward, we love to have you be a part of those missions. And this summer, we are not done yet. Um, in the next couple weeks, we have Falls Creek and Vacation Bible School. Find you a spot to be involved, whether that is giving, whether it is serving, whether it is praying intentionally and specifically for leaders and students. Church, we can't do these activities without you. Uh, and we are thankful for all that you do um, as the body of Christ. And as you go this week, as always, abide in Christ, proclaim the gospel, build the church, and go make disciples wherever you're at.